Hey everyone, this is Seth Mariano with a new episode of More Layers. So, it's just me again this time, because Jordan has got some family... ...gathering... ...family visit, apparently. So, it's just gonna be me this time for that reason. We were planning to do a video on a topic different than the one I'm gonna do today. We'll probably get to that, the two of us, next week. In the meantime, I thought I'd do a little show of my own. So today, I want to talk about a topic that I think is probably not as often talked about as it ought to be. More specifically, the topic of mistaken assumptions or fallacies, I believe, is a, a word for it. Specifically in the Christian culture. I myself identify as a Christian personally. I am personally a person of faith, of faith in Christ. In a way, you could probably say it's central to my history, my experiences, the bulk of them. At the end of the day, personally, it's my top priority. And I think sometimes I see a sad prevalence of ways of thinking or conveying ideas that are misleading and likely to a sort of destructive, potentially destructive, extent. And when I think of a couple or so of these, of the examples that I'm going to talk about, I guess I kind of wonder, or think, is it any wonder why so many aren't interested in Jesus? Or this God stuff that we are trying to promote? or get people to jump in on. The Christian culture, I wouldn't say, is guilty of this like 24-7, but probably way too often, though. So, I'm going to go through a list that I have written in advance of what I see as the biggest fallacies in Christian culture. So the first one I want to talk about is new creation always equals huge renovation. I myself believe I have been guilty in the past of assuming this myself. There may be some partial truth to that. I know there's that one epistle verse that says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. But maybe a lot of us who have claimed that faith have maybe taken that to such, like, an out-of-proportion extreme that, that some of us have maybe gone on to feel like, oh, oh, we failed, we're done. If we don't see immediate or up there change in ourselves, or rapid change, or if if several or maybe a lot of our old habits are still lingering after we've kind of made that move and said yes to God. But I think the truth is, it's a process that takes time. And we all probably have to go through a rather slow process of growth or improvement, even after God has opened your eyes to you know, why this problem you've been having is a problem and or why what you've been doing or why this thing you've been doing is wrong. Even after he's made that clear to you, 
Now, the habits can still be hard to break, at least for a little while, probably. The success isn't just, like, overnight. It's like, I guess you could say it's like smoking. Though, what do I know about it? I've never done that. Like, you remember one guy maybe saying in a commercial, uh, he had tried quitting smoking cold turkey, but that didn't work. Rather, I think, that maybe in a lot of cases, if not all of them, you have to rather wean off the old bad stuff. You may have to continue to struggle for a little while longer or so. Oh, and gradually you might find yourself wanting less and less to do that thing. And then it may get to an eventual point where you don't want to do it at all, or it doesn't occur to you to try it again, or something like that, maybe. So that's the first one. Now I want to move on to the second one, the myth that I see, the second myth. Some are beyond all hope. In a sense, the Christian culture, or, or I should maybe say people within it, may be to blame for the popularity of this idea. I think another part of it might be, might be well, by innocent mistake or something, maybe, the fault of the news. Most every story in the news today seems to be about, about a crime or, or someone prestigious getting in trouble or something like that. And some of these people keep popping up again and again in the headlines. And I imagine people see them showing up again on the screen and they go, oh, there they go again. Curse this person, kill them. They may have what God would consider righteous anger because somebody's getting hurt or, or something, or simply because it's ungodly what's being talked about. At the same time, when I hear some people talk like that, gives me the impression that they're arrogant or conceited or something. Again, I'm not saying that it is dumb or wrong to be angry at someone for doing something. If you were to ask, I would say, just be careful. I think that's what I would say. Just be careful. Watch your pride or watch your ego. You've got some problems of your own you probably just don't want to admit, and so do I. In a sense, everyone who's in God's family is picked in advance to be part of it. That's, I guess, a whole nother topic. Probably worth discussing more, but uh, maybe not now. But as a lot of us Christians probably say, God is a God of miracles. Even those who are the worst among our world now can be among the chosen. We just don't know who. Moving on to myth number three. Leadership means complete dominance. This may be the trickiest, or one of the trickiest, because in a sense there are roles with varying degrees of power over or under others. So it's probably really easy for most of us if not all of us, to, by innocent mistake, assume something like the leader has all the power or, or the lead can't have a voice or the leader's power is unlimited. Within any structure, like a government or a family, or something like that. And there are rules that are higher that that are higher than others that belong to different individuals within. When it's at its best, nobody's off the hook, nor are they a victim. When it's at its best, everyone 
everyone respects each other. Um, everyone lets each other do the part they were meant to. And maybe sometimes everyone can be kind of a jack of all the trades and master of one. In a sense, it may seem unfair to be assigned a lower role, but ultimately that doesn't really make you less important or less of a person. You've got plenty. Everyone's got plenty to bring to the table. I suppose if everyone's roles and power were the same, either one person would have the whole load to carry on their plate, so to speak, or everyone would have a full plate or something like that, maybe. I think maybe there needs to be kind of a balance. Maybe not a totally even balance, but but you probably don't want to go all the way to one side or the other. Let's move on to number four. Love and tolerance are one and the same. Over the years, a lot of us have probably gotten used to hearing love be defined as absolute approval. We might hear phrases like, man, I love that hair. Or, I love this show. But really, the real definition is rather complicated. There probably is some, at least some, degree of approval involved. But there's more to it than just that. There's dimensions of approval, the dimension of care, maybe others. In some cases, there may be feelings of affection involved, but that probably is just a byproduct. Love isn't just saying, all right, you want it, you got it. Whatever you like, whatever makes you feel good, it's right for you, you take it. I just remembered there's a quote that uh, Mark Lowry said in a book. Everyone knows a good dad sometimes has to say no. And interestingly enough, the chapter is titled, God Says No Too. If everyone said yes all the time, then the whole world would probably just be way beyond chaotic. On to the next one, which might be right up there. Everything you do determines everything that happens to you. Maybe there's some stuff in the Bible here and there about God punishing evil, rewarding good. But it's probably not absolute, like a lot of people may think or a lot of people may have thought. This is probably a misleading message that is conveyed more often by other religions, maybe deliberately and unconsciously by Christianity as well. The idea that if you say and do all the right things, everything's going to go your way, or everything's going to go how it ought to, or nothing's going to be a mess. But I think I can tell you from personal experience, that isn't so. Um, just the other day, I was driving home from work. I had my windshield wipers on maximum speed, because it was pouring rain. Even with the wipers going at full speed, it was still not that easy for me to see in the pouring rain. Some would probably say, man, these are useless. Just today, I was getting low on gas, so I went to the gas station and pulled up next to a pump. And put my credit card in. It didn't work. I tried another station. Same problem. I wound up paying at the counter at the first place. Well, maybe that was a fluke. Maybe that won't happen again. I don't know. But uh, either way, do you get my point, though? I did everything I was supposed to do, but still things didn't go quite like they ought to. Number six, people can save the world. This is something all or most of us might like the idea of, successfully turning the world around. There was one church that shall not be named. I heard more than once say, the church is the hope of the world. 
I can't say I know for certain what was meant by that, but I still think that's dangerous to say. My senior pastor corrected this once, said, Christ is the hope. We're the messenger. And if people could save the world, then... I don't know if a legitimate point would be seen in in seeking God or whatever. And I think if you think about it, no one's got enough time to take care of even a half, maybe a quarter of what's wrong. And probably especially when they've got their own problems they got to deal with. I'm not saying don't try to make a spiritual contribution of any kind, of any amount. Rather, I'm saying don't expect too much. Or don't try too hard to fix the damage. Number seven, you could probably say, is conceptually similar. You can solve all your own problems all by yourself. In a way, I guess you could say, God is widely viewed as kind of a mere fuel to get you started. Or an engine. When I think... If you look at the scripture, if you look at the one scripture on the list that I, I typed up next to this one, I have a whole list of references for all these myths in the episode description. If you look at the one that I typed up in my notes for this myth, and it'll be second from the bottom of the list in the description, you just might see that everyone whom God has adopted pretty much ultimately had nothing. Nothing within them to fix themselves. But they may have gotten a little bit better or so in some areas. But at the end of the day, they needed something or someone bigger to make the change that they really needed it. And that doesn't entirely go away after the conversion is made or after one is saved. Even after that, to some extent, the person still needs help that ultimately a person can't provide. Not even the saved person. I probably have struggled a lot to think that that is so. But lately I have found myself, morning after morning, Asking God at the beginning of the day, please help. To some degree, I may have it in my head that I can do okay on my own at least, but but still, there continues to linger this sense that I don't have what it takes at the end of the day to make it all right. Finally, and this one may be the biggest myth of them all, God needs people's help. And maybe my guess is that this is maybe due to a misinterpretation of scriptures like like the scripture known as the Great Commission or what's in Matthew 5.16. People have probably assumed that they that they are saying, It's up to you guys. You do well enough, everything will be okay. Or if you come up short, game's over. A lot of times, I don't know if this is intentional or not. I think maybe, maybe churches and ministries kind of bombard people with, maybe not necessarily on purpose, but nonetheless interrogating questions like, how much are you giving? How involved are you in ministry? How well have you been performing at all that? But in the words of Sky Jatani, God does not need you to accomplish anything. He wants you. I say, let's each do a part of our own. Each of us in God's family do a part of our own. But try not to put that pressure on ourselves to put up solid numbers, excel, or perform really well. I just remembered something uh, when Matt Hasselbeck was getting ready to play in Super Bowl Forty. Coach said to him, God's on the throne, whether we win or not. not all of Even if we win, we're not on the throne, he is.
do think God wants us to be involved, to be actively involved in what he's up to. But he doesn't need us. I think rather he wants to use us. Well, I think that's all that I can think to say about this stuff. This kind of stuff I don't normally talk about, but I figured it was important to address. And thank you all for watching and or listening. All completed More Layers episodes are on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcast, YouTube, and, and every completed episode YouTube link I put on our Facebook page. And I think my cousin's graduation party is next weekend, so I don't know if we'll do an episode next week. I guess we'll find out. Well, maybe Jordan and I will go to that together if he wants to. But thanks anyway for following this show, and see you next time.